I am continually amazed by the awesome power and glory of God, how God is faithful to his name, is faithful to his word. <clears throat> there are some people who have been fasting and praying in our church, seeking the Lord for his purpose, his will, so on and so forth. And I'd like to give a little word of counsel, a little word of pastoral insight. I've had so many people tell me over the decades of ministry. I said, Pastor, I started to fast and pray and all the hell broke loose. I quit fasting and praying. And I can tell you in my experience that fasting and praying, I experienced some very powerful antagonism, powerful negative results, ungodliness toward me, fasting and praying. So I want to give you this pastoral insight tonight. If you choose to be closer to the Lord and begin to be a prayer warrior or an intercessor, do intercessory prayer, or interceder, or intercessor in prayer, or to fast and to pray, combining it or otherwise separate, either way. Let me explain something that you need to understand about the dynamics of fasting and praying. Fasting and praying will tell you where you stand in your faith. Because fasting and praying will anger your soul's enemy more than anything else. The devil's not angry when you don't pray. The devil's not mad at you when you're not fasting and seeking God. The devil's not mad at you. In fact, he's quite pleased with you when you don't attend church. But when you start to commit your way unto the Lord, your life, to commit your aspirations, your dreams, your hopes, and your plans to God, and give Him your whole being, as you draw closer to Him, He draws closer to you. However, there's a third party dynamic that takes place that comes into, into play here. Because, and, and this may sound almost self-defeating, but I'd be surprised if nothing bad would occur from your fasting and praying. Well, Pastor, that's not what I'm praying for. I'm praying for good things that happen, not for bad things. <laughs> but bad things must come before the good. And I'll tell you why. Because it will tell you where you are in your faith for one thing, and you'll walk with God. Number two, it's a clear sign that your fasting and praying is effective. If it wasn't effective, you wouldn't scare the devil. Amen. You would not be a threat to the devil. When you fast and pray, you become an active warrior for God. And Satan sees you, the threat that you become more in a greater way than you are now. Thirdly, he knows that the more you fast and pray, the greater the divine power that is innately within you, the greater the power of God in you, demonstratedly so. So he's not happy with that, not pleased with that. So my little pastoral insight and counsel to you is this. Don't give up on fasting and praying Amen. just because you got the devil mad at you. In fact, it's a sure sign of encouragement for you to go on fasting and praying. What happened to Jesus when he fasted and prayed for 40 days? What was the end result of that? He was hungry. No, no, no. 
physically. But what happened at the end of that, that period of time? Was it God that blessed him or did Satan show up? Satan. Oh! You got that? You fast and pray, Satan shows up, you wonder why. Just look at Jesus' life. You fast and pray, Satan showed up. So you're better than him. It's going to happen to you. Yeah. I, I was talking uh, to uh, a church. And we talked about fasting and praying. And, and I'm still going to do it. But when I say it, I promise I am going to do it. The day that I set out to do it, the Lord Jesus said, I didn't pray. I was going to my prayer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Even the very day, what she's saying is that I had made a, a, a promise that I'm going to start fasting. She said, just mentioning that I'm going to start fasting and praying, turn the devil mad at you. So I understand something. If you want to know about fasting and praying and, and what could happen to you, all just look at the, at the life of Jesus. When he fasted and prayed, it, it angered the demonic powers of this world. This should be a constant encouragement to you that you're on track with God. Amen. Mm -hmm. When the devil's not mad at you and he's not fighting you, that's when you really should be concerned. And fourthly, you need to understand that when you are challenged by the devil this way and things are disrupted, your life becomes so disrupted, it's incredible. incredible. You need to understand that you're bringing yourself up to a new level with God. A new plane. You're bringing yourself up to a new dimension of God's glory and power in your life. You're reaching new altitudes with God. Isn't that a fantastic proposition? How many feel that you can go up a little higher from where you are now? You can stand and be a little higher in the Lord? Mm -hmm. And so, I encourage you, go ahead and fast and pray. But don't be surprised if things begin to fray at the seams. Don't be surprised if Satan gets mad. That's okay. Because if you're <coughs> forewarned, then you'll be forearmed. Amen. If I give you the counsel before and warn you that something's going to happen, you should then take that and be prepared for the consequence of it. But if I don't tell you what's going to happen, then you'll be left in a lurk and you'll never do it again because you think that God's not mad at you, not at all. And so it gives, when you fast, let me do it this way. Remember what John the Baptist said, he must increase and I must decrease, right? He, Jesus, talking about Jesus, he must increase and I must decrease. Fasting and praying decreases your presence. In other words, the you, the I, the it, the you, is decreased, diminished, and Christ is increased and exalted in you. Because it's a moral, spiritual purging. Alright? So don't be surprised. How many understand what that, uh, there's a treatment that they give to you if you have some skin cancer. And uh, it's a cream. You put it on, and you rub it on your area or wherever they feel there might be some cancer. And uh, what it does, it penetrates in order to expose the cancer. If there's there, if there's cancer there, rubbing that on there for a period of time will expose the cancer. So fasting and praying is like that cream. It'll tell you where the bad stuff is. It'll expose the wrong. It'll expose the flesh. It'll expose what's not of God. And then you can cut it out. You can get rid of it. I think that's a good deal. Right? Amen. Are right, you ready? I just need to have that little reprieve here in order to give you some insight on that fasting and praying. All right, so don't be discouraged about fasting. Do it, do it, because you're going to be blessed. Don't take off on a tangent if you've never fasted before and go on a 40, 50-day fast. Well, no, don't do that. No, 
start with a day, start with a two meals, one meal, three meals, whatever, two days, one day, just start slow and spend time in prayer. And I will tell you this also, just a word of advice. You're not going to feel, much now, during the fasting period, you're not going to feel that close to the Lord. Because the hunger pain is going to distract you. And your preoccupation with things around you will distract you. You'll be amazed, all right? You will think that you're further from God than you've ever been when you're fasting. During the fast is not where you see the greatest benefits. During the Get this, get this. During the fast is not when you see the greatest benefit of fasting. It's after the fast. After you've done it. When was the power of God released on Jesus? Before or after the fast? Before, during, or after the fast? The power of God was released on The Bible says he went in to the wilderness full of the Holy Ghost, but he came out with wisdom and power. Amen. All right? So God's with you. The Holy Spirit's with you when you take off on your fast. But... The Judean wilderness is anything but pleasant. I've been in a Judea wilderness out there in Israel, and there's nothing pretty about that place. It 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 it, it looks like Idaho somewhere. I mean, it's just nothing out there. And uh, but so during the fast, you're not going to feel super close to God because your flesh is screaming for attention. You're looking for attention. Your emotions are disrupted. Your mind is teeter-tottering. Should I continue or not? You're battling. You understand what I'm saying? All through that period of time, you're, you're, uh, you're not going to feel God. But when you're done and you give God the glory, the results of that fast are going to be extraordinary. You must, yeah. If you're going to fast, don't fast and not pray. If you're going to fast, make sure you add prayer to that. Because trust me, you will need prayer. <laughs> you will need prayer when you start fasting. Uh, one time I fasted, and when I got to the seventh day, seven full days of fasting, hunger completely left me. You can put a you can put a pizza or a filet mignon in front of me. I, I, I had it just didn't fizz on me at all. To me, that filet mignon looked like a rainy day. There was there was just no connection with food after seven days. The first three days is false hunger pains, by the way. Yeah, but that's all false hunger. All that is the first three days is that your stomach is used to feeling full. It's not true hunger. It's just looking for what it's used to. That's right. First three days. You're not even hungry. Well, you feel like you are, but it's not it's a false hunger. After seven days, the hunger leaves you. You will not return until the 21st day. And the 21st day, you'll be hungry to kill it. I mean, we're, we're talking about hungry the 21st. Past that, that only lasts for a day or two. Then go up to the 30th, and they will hit you again. And then when they get to the 40th, Hunger will return. Hunger will return. If you don't eat after 40 days, you begin to starve to death. So, only 40 days is the max. Uh, if, if someone's going on, we used to like a 20 day fast or whatever, or maybe a 10 day fast, do they, is there a proper way to come off of the fast? You must, very, very important. You don't come off with a spaghetti dinner, okay, right. or a three, right. three course dinner. What do you I've just been No. Soup. Anywhere from. Uh, uh, you know those, uh, uh, so the, it's practice. like a soup, just a plain like chicken broth, oh, broth bouillon, and bouillon. bouillons and soups, uh, like uh, chicken broth, broths and so on and so forth. Yeah, first day when you come back off, just start with the broth. Because your stomach now has forgotten how to digest, it's forgotten how to eat. It's forgotten how to eat. And you have to retrain your, your, your whole system. But never ever stop drinking. If you don't drink water during that period of time, you will dehydrate beginning in two to three days. Oh. You must drink water during that whole period. I don't know how we got off to this tangent, but 
But if, but if he's in front, no, if you have a medical condition and you're taking uh, prescription drugs every day, forget about it. You're not going to take drugs. You're not going to take drugs and be on a fast. That's not going to work. It's not going to be very dangerous for you. Salting it, crackers. Salt, no, no, you're not fasting. If you have no salting crackers, you're not fasting anymore. So fast, fast is absence or abstinence of food. Completely, that's a fast. And so, anyways, it, it's good information. You okay? Is this okay? This information I'm giving you? Yeah. Yes. Right? Well, is well, it, is it in the structure? Huh? What would you recommend? Dave, um, whatever would you recommend to somebody who's never done it? Well, it depends. Well, I, I'd have to interview them and ask them if they're on any kind of prescription for drugs. If they're uh, if it's a physical body. I think, it, I think it'd be wise, especially when you get to a certain age past 40, so on and so forth. If you want to start fasting, you, you better get a physical. Because you don't know what you're setting yourself up for. Not, you should get a physical and tell you about what you plan on doing. And if you do, it start, like I say, for a person who's never fasted before, don't go off on a 40 day, 21 day. Uh, I would go maximum three days the first time, maximum three days, if your body can handle that period of time, okay? Then maybe two, three, four months later, which was seven days. And then after seven days, you won't even feel hungry. Food won't even come up onto your, onto your radar. Radio, the food won't even come on your radar. You won't even think about food. Even the food that you smell cooking, it, won't, it, it doesn't show up on the radar. Doesn't even show up. How many think that'd be great if you can get by and you smell food? What's that? That's, that looks like smells like exhaust fumes from a car. I mean, it just there, there's no there's no correlation after seven days. You can't the, the, the body can't assimilate the smell of food with food. It, it's just it leaves you. It, that's the nice part. After seven days, I felt so great. After seven days, I felt like a whole new person. In one week in that seven day period, I lost 18 pounds. Well, and that one week, so I didn't fast to lose weight. I just felt that I needed to do that before the war. But that was back when I was in my 30s, and uh, it's a different time now. However, anyways, good uh, good exchange here. Yes. Yeah. Pastor, yeah. Right? And so, uh, be sure. Question. Yes. If you're fasting, it doesn't have to be. I mean, can't you just fast from one meal? Well, here, here's the problem with fasting one meal. You cannot separate yourself unto the Lord for one meal to make it uh, a consequential thing, to make it an effective thing. Because if you're fasting, you're not. You shouldn't be fasting. It shouldn't be done simply to delay from eating. When you fast, is to separate yourself unto the Lord. You understand what I'm saying? You don't fast a meal. Why? Because you're going to keep doing the housework. You're going to be running around. You're going to... No, that's not what it's for. Then, then if you want to lose weight, that'll work for you. I mean, just go two meals even. But don't call that fasting for spiritual reasons. Because <coughs> fasting must be coupled with prayer, along with God, away from life's activities. Right, so you can't just fast one meal and be in prayer during that whole time. You can't, no, no, because you know, one meal, you, you, there's not, it does not, you have, what, four hours, three hours? It, 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 it won't, uh, your mind has not settled in one meal period from your daily activities. You haven't, your mind hasn't even slowed down. So it is, it's impossible for you for one meal to, uh, to have a spiritual effect uh, of any benefit or consequence, you know, positive consequence. But now if for your health reasons, it would be good for you to fast a meal, just to not eat. But if you're going to do that, don't fast breakfast. I would fast supper. Is there something that people like you to take? Is there something that we can do just No, there's nothing. So, we so, like I say, if you want to fast one meal, fast supper. You can eat a good breakfast, good lunch, but don't eat until the next breakfast. That's, that would be, a, that would be a, a very, if it's for your health, it would be good. But remember, now I was still pastoring at the time. So I still had, my daily, I was at the office, but I wasn't 
in and out, in and out, trying to run after one person, deliver another person, pick up a person, you know, busy like that. No. You have to separate yourself unto the Lord when you fast. Spend that time in prayer, seeking the Lord, devoting your time, your thoughts. What you're fasting for is to separate you from the world's preoccupation. That's what, you, that's what fasting does. That's what it's for. So that you don't think about your normal things. You don't preoccupy your mind with your daily routine stuff. Now, you may still have to do some laundry when they get that. That's benign. There's no, no problem there. But fasting is to separate you unto the Lord. The physical benefit is a, is a bonus. It has nothing to do with your fasting. You know, so it's to separate you. So if you're if you're going to start on the fast, make sure that you that you understand going in that it's to separate you unto the Lord. You're going to spend that time with Christ. Uh, and, 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 do you have a uh, yeah, it's it, it just it's exactly right. It's just like being, it, yeah, you have to take that time. Say you went on a week's vacation. Well, if you're going to fast for a week, pretend you're on a vacation except you didn't leave home. You went as far as Porchville. Okay? <laughs> Saved a lot of gas. And uh, so on and so forth. But, but separate yourself from the Lord. Does that make sense? So if it's one day, then you've got to plan what you're not going to do that day. If it's for two days, you've got to plan for that two-day period. You're out of commission. You're not doing anything for those two days. You're going to wait on the Lord. You're going to pray. You're going to seek God. Okay? In that, it's also important to not, uh, don't be going from person to person talking about I'm fasting and fasting. Don't go bragging around no, no, no. that I'm in a fast. You keep that to yourself between you and God. Yeah. Between you and God. Yeah, yeah. That's that's also another very important uh, point to be made. Jesus condemned the Pharisees for exploiting their spirituality and their self righteousness by going in front of the people, wailing from their fasting in public on the street corners, wailing, "Oh my God, I'm fasting for you! I'm fasting for you!" And I'm praying. Did you, did you think they heard me? Did you make a little louder? Okay. Thank you, God. I've done this time of fasting and praying. And so. They do this to be seen and heard of men. Now, that wouldn't be the case for you. But you need to also remember that, uh, as the word says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. In, this, in terms of giving, it's the same thing with fasting. You don't want to put it on Facebook. It's when everybody start my fast day, they all pray for me. No, don't do that. No, 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 no. Because this is a very personal, private affair between you and God. Now, if you want to tell your pastors this one thing. Pastor, when we actually fasted for a day, Satan didn't come into the picture. There was no room in the room but just for the Holy Spirit. You could feel anything but. Right, but you stayed home in the room. There you go. There you go. There you go. See? You didn't even step in. Right. You see, but that what happens in a case like that where you isolate yourself, you reduce the chances, but you still disrupted the devil's plans, one way or another. And sometimes after the fast, it shows up. So it's not during the fast, like I said before, that's the fun part. And because there's no there's no personal at that moment, you know, you become grouchy. You know, you can become irritable, so on and so forth. <laughs> How, how many become, honestly, how many become a little irritable and grouchy if you haven't eaten? Yeah, yeah he said that. He said amen. Yeah. So, you understand, that's why uh, if you're a married couple, both of you should not fast at the same time. <laughs> Don't go there, all right? <laughs> and if you've got kids that are two or three, four, five years old, and you have to cook for them and clean dirty diapers and stuff, they're going fat. That's not a good time. Ask your sister, your brother to babysit them, whatever the case might be, get them out of the house. It's your time with Jesus. In your closet, as it were, you know, figuratively speaking, your time with the Lord. Amen. And these things happen on Isaiah 35, chapter 35, on the highway of holiness. On the highway of holiness um, is, is a place where you do fast and you 
pray. Right? The highway phone is Teresa to the scene tonight. Right. So glad you came. God bless you. Oh, they're all saying hello to you. Wait to the camera. They want to say hello to you too. All right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I want to bring you to Ephesians chapter 4. If you have your Bibles with you. I want you to turn with me please to Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 1. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. I don't have my, my board here, and if I did, it wouldn't be big enough. So I'll have to verbalize it as much as I possibly can and see if you can uh, make your own designs and graphs and so on. If you want to put Ephesians on the top of your page and then split the page in half and put chapters 1, 2, and 3 on the left side and then on the right side chapters 4, 5, and 6. Because I want to show you the connecting word. Diane, what is the, the word therefore? is a conjunction, right? Therefore is a conjunction. Now, and I want to see this here. I therefore. Everybody say therefore. Yeah. All right. So, this is a the, the conjunction here is 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 a connector. It, it's a it's a it's a connector of two things. It, it, this this is a link. The word therefore links what's been previously said to what he's about to say. Are you getting that? Right. The word therefore links what's just been said to what I'm about to say. It's a congestion. Congestion, right? A connector. The prison of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Now, we're on the highway, and we are called on this highway to walk with the Lord. Is that correct? Right. We, we were called on to walk with the Lord. That means to interact with the Lord. Now, what I want to show you some things. You'll be able to write some thoughts down. I believe it's going to help you a lot. I therefore, the prison of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy. Everybody say, walk worthy. Walk worthy. I'm, I'm, I'm going to break down in the Greek, parapeteo, which is the Greek word for walk, and so on and so forth. We won't go into all of that detail. but Those two words, walk worthy, need to be clarified and described for you. Otherwise, it will not have the desired effect all right, for your soul. All right, of the calling with which you be called. Now, I, I want to show, put that put down in the top right corner, my calling is the most important thing. <laughs> and I, I'm not talking about your ministry calling. I'm not talking about pastor, evangelist, teacher, prophet, apostle, not that calling. Your calling as a child of God. You're calling to a relationship with God. You're calling to this highway of holiness. You're calling to Christianity. You're calling to the kingdom of God. That calling. You're calling to salvation. You're calling to salvation is the most important thing in your life. If you don't realize the importance of that calling, you're going to neglect your salvation. You're going to neglect your walk. Everybody repeat after me. I am called of God. I am called of God. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, all things work together for good to them who love the Lord and who are called according to his eternal purpose. Called. Called means to be called out, singled out, plucked out, taken out, and be brought in. Disconnected to be reconnected with God. We were called to be the children of God. We were called to salvation. We were called to eternal life. We were called to redemption. We were called to be part of the family of God. We were called to be a witness for God. Our calling is what you must hold 
with great preeminence in your mind. If your Christianity does not rise above that which you've nearly been raised in, you're failing to see the calling and it's become familiar and it's become stagnant and it's become ineffective. But if you're a child of God by rebirth, you are called of God. Who called you out of darkness. Who said that? Into his marvelous light. All right, who said that? Well, not in the Bible. But who? Huh? You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Huh? Who said that? Who? No, not some, no. Peter. Peter in his epistle, you are a holy nation. You are a, 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 a holy priesthood, a holy people, who has come, who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. So our calling, you get that now? So I, who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light? That's the calling that must have preeminence. in our life, in our mind, in our thinking, in our purpose, in our walk, in our daily choices and decisions, in our daily activities, actions and reactions, who called us out of darkness. That's just heaven see if you can't find that. You're a holy nation or a holy priesthood, whatever, royal priesthood, a holy nation or a royal priesthood. To show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness. Once you get it, you can bring it up. So here, I want you to be walking worthy of that calling, all right? Here you go, First Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. You are a chosen generation, a royal person, a holy nation, his own special people. Unique, the word special, there should be unique. That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you, there's a word called, out of darkness into his marvelous light. That, you see, the fact that you're a Christian by rebirth is your calling. Isn't that wonderful? It's your calling. You were called by God into purpose. Called by God out of darkness into his light so that you don't live a blase life that has no meaning. But we've been called out of into his so the calling is there. You'll see throughout the whole of the apostolic, pastoral apostolic letters about our calling. Paul talked about our calling, John, James. All of them, and, and Peter, we, they all talked about our calling. Isn't it a wonderful thing to, 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 to grasp in our mind that we are the called of God? I got a phone call last night from my Uncle Sam in Montreal. He called me out of Canada. <laughs> God called me out of darkness, but he called me out of camp. And we had a nice conversation. He's looking forward to us being together in my Isle of Palms the other day this month for a couple of days. The family reunion. And I'll tell you, I enjoyed receiving the call from Sam. I don't get to speak to him very often. Diane speaks to her as a family, sisters and brother, periodically. And when she receives a call from them, hope to me, it's going to be it's glory. It's Connie, or it's Miss Larry, or it's Chris. I mean, somebody in the family that calls, and something all of a sudden lights up when somebody special calls. Is that correct? Amen. 
especially when you apply for a job and they call you. I mean, know you feel like you have a calling when a company calls you. And I know, Karen, that when you get a call from a prospective buyer, they, that's how, that feels good when you get a special call like that, especially when you're pretty sure it's going to be a sale. It's a call. There's something special about the call. And I need for us to fully understand that we were called by God. How do you know that God had our number? Yes. Amen. Right? God had our number. Are you glad that God had your number? Yes. Amen. Before you had a phone, He had your number. <laughs> and He called you out of darkness into His body. Let's go back down to Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1. Now that we have established the calling, we have to establish the fact that we are now called to walk in the newness of life. Is that correct? That's Romans chapter 6. If we've been buried with him in the likeness of his death, we will also be raised in the likeness of his resurrection. For those of us who have been buried, baptized into Jesus have been raised into a new life. All things have passed away. All things have become new. Now we have established the important significance of the call. Now you have to understand that you've been called to activation. The calling has activated your life into the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now you're supposed to walk. Now you're supposed to walk in your calling here. Now the word, work, uh, the word walk in the Greek is parapateo. Here's what I want you to understand about walking. The walking in parapateo in the Greek means to go about, to go about. demonstratingly that you can walk. And that's important. Get, get 